Lotus is undoubtedly a classic brand. However, as the company moves into the EV era with 2000 horsepower hypercars and SUVs, it can sometimes be difficult to remember what made them so iconic during their golden years. At one point, Lotus was best known for the Wedge. By the early 1970s, Lotus had become a household name, primarily thanks to their three Formula One drivers championships in the 60s. Not wanting to slow down, the company was looking for their next big step, specifically with their road cars. The Elan and the Europa were popular enough, sure, but decidedly of the last decade. This look to the future all began with Tony Rudd. Rudd himself had started at Lotus in 1970, and rather quickly started brainstorming ideas for Lotus in the upcoming decade. He would eventually settle on two particular ideas. The first, codenamed M50, would eventually become the radical new Lotus Elite of 1974, a four-seater meant to replace the outgoing Elan Plus 2, as well as to bring Lotus more upmarket away from their kit car roots and be more in line with the likes of Porsche and especially their Formula 1 rival Ferrari. However, it would be the second project, M70, that would make for the trump card. In 1971, Lotus boss Colin Chapman would meet with legendary designer Giorgetto Giugiaro to discuss the latter penning up the new mid-engine sports car. Giugiaro had recently debuted the Maserati Boomerang concept. It was felt that the striking angular appearance of the Boomerang was exactly what the M70 should be aiming for. And with that, Giugiaro set about creating his next piece of art. Despite early wind tunnel tests being disappointing, the project would see its first concept in 1972, based on a stretched Europa chassis, and would be dubbed the Silver Car. It debuted at the Turin Motor Show that year, and the positive reception, particularly to its angular wedge-like appearance, would convince Chapman to continue the project. This would be followed in 1973 by the Red Car, the first fully working prototype. Lotus now had a true Ferrari rival on its hands. However, unlike many Italian supercars of the time, the M70, now known by its production name, the Esprit, lacked one major factor, a big, powerful V8 or V12 engine. Instead, the Esprit would be powered by a 2-litre four-cylinder, Lotus's own 16-valve Type 907 engine, putting out about 160 horsepower. This was the first Lotus in-house designed engine, and was first used in the Jensen Healey. Many believe this was done so that Lotus could iron out any issues before putting the thing in their own car. Despite the smaller than usual engine, in the midst of an oil crisis, the four-cylinder was actually rather appealing, and the 900kg curb weight meant the Esprit was actually quite nippy. By early 1975, the Esprit was ready to go into production. However, with the Elan and Europa out of production, and the Elite being a financial failure primarily due to the oil crisis, the Esprit had to be a success if Lotus was going to stay afloat. The Series 1 or S1 Esprit finally launched in 1976, and not a moment too soon. While praised for its handling and lightweight body, it was ultimately deemed to be underpowered, with the 0 60 time of 8 seconds not being terrible, but it wasn't exactly impressive either, and the initially reported top speed of 140 miles an hour was more like 133 in real world conditions. Still, despite these issues, it was the success that Lotus was looking for. This was compounded thanks to the car's famous appearance in the 1977 Bond film The Spy Who Loved Me, infamously transforming into a car-submarine hybrid dubbed Wet Nelly. I'm sure she was. The S1 would only last two years in production, however, as in 1978 the Esprit S2 would be launched. It wasn't a massive deviation from the S1, mainly featuring a few cosmetic and mechanical updates. This included new rear lights, new cooling ducts, a new front spoiler and new alloys. Unlike the S1 though, the S2 would see a number of special editions. The first was the commemorative edition of 1978, wherein the John Player & Sons colour scheme to celebrate the team's constructors title in the 1978 F1 season. 
In 1980, the S2.2 would debut, featuring a 2.2 litre four cylinder engine, really getting into the high displacement stuff. However, the coolest addition was by far the Essex Turbo Esprit, also debuting in 1980. The turbo part of the name was courtesy of Garrett, the Essex part referring to Lotus's F1 sponsor at the time, which heavily featured in the car's paint scheme. Being the first factory turbocharged Esprit, dealer conversions had been offered prior, power was increased to a pretty respectable 210, pulling the 0 60 time down to just 6.1 seconds, and finally breaking the 150 mile an hour top speed barrier. Plus, with a new rear spoiler, upgraded brakes, upgraded suspension and a revised chassis, the Essex Turbo was easily the sportiest Esprit yet, even with the notion that it was originally meant to be fitted with a V8. However, it wasn't the Esprit's time for that just yet. A year after the Essex was launched, the S3 and Turbo Esprits hit showroom floors. The S3 was pretty standard, just a few updates, and the Turbo Esprit was largely the same as the Essex version, just without the name slapped on the side, making it a much cheaper alternative. After a lot of revisions, updates and changes since the Esprit's original launch in 1976, Lotus had a proper supercar on its lineup. Power was now able to keep up with competitors, and the newly revised suspension and chassis made handling some of the best on the road. However, just as Lotus was starting to reap their award, Colin Chapman died suddenly in 1982. As Chapman was the creative driving force behind the company, rather quickly Lotus would lose sight of where they were heading. With the addition of the complete failure of the DeLorean DMC-12, which Lotus helped to develop, and the rather convoluted ownership setup with the likes of JCB and Toyota having a look in, the company's finances began to crumble. This meant that, once again, the Esprit would be the difference between Lotus seeing out the next few years, or not. A cosmetic revision appeared in 1985, and in 1986 the HC was launched, standing for high compression. The S3 HC made 170 horsepower, and the Turbo HC made 215. The first fuel-injected Esprit also made an appearance in the American market in the same year. The Esprit revisions were able to keep Lotus afloat for a few more years, just long enough for American giant General Motors to buy them out entirely in 1986. With the extra cash on hand, Lotus was now able to afford a complete update for the Esprit, which, under all the revisions, was still largely the same car from 1976. While Jujaro had penned a legendary design, Lotus wanted something different for the next one. Peter Stevens was brought in to draw up the new design, of course being the man who would go on to design the legendary McLaren F1. Stevens went for a much softer look than Jujaro's sharp angular take, with a fiberglass mock-up gaining positive feedback, including from the Esprit's original designer, the new Esprit went into production. Despite the new body, most of the original components were carried straight over from the previous generation. While the power remained the same, 0-60 times had dropped as low as 5.1 seconds in the turbo model. Interestingly though, this new 4th gen Esprit would not be called the S4, instead it would be called by its project name, the X180. In 1990, Lotus would unveil the X180R, a stripped down, refined 285 horsepower version for homologation into the SCCA Escort World Challenge Series, a championship in which it would see four wins. It would go on to see 15 wins across different championships, and would claim the 1992 World Challenge Series, which would be the final major championship to ever be won by a Lotus. The Sport 300 would be sold in Europe in 1993 to celebrate, being a modified version of the X180R, pushing out an impressive 302 horsepower. Despite the refresh and the motorsporting success, however, the Esprit began to falter, especially with a new generation of competition coming over from Japan, most notably in the form of the NSX. And so, in 1993, Lotus would finally launch the S4, not featuring too much new apart from a few cosmetic updates courtesy of Julian Thompson, a refined 264 horsepower engine, and power steering for the first time. 
Though small changes on the surface, these updates made sure that the Esprit was fresh enough to see out the 90s. This was aided by yet more variants. The S4 Sport was launched in 1994, with modifications pushing horsepower to 301 and a top speed of 168 miles per hour. This was followed in 1997 by the GT3, which, among other changes, would be powered by a 2-litre four-cylinder, as opposed to the standard 2.2-litre. Lotus themselves said this was done to make the GT3 more cost-effective, however, it's more likely that Lotus had a few unused 2 litres sat around following production of the car in Italy. The country offered tax breaks on engines of 2 litres or less, hence the reduced displacement of the Italian and now the GT3 Esprit. Moving back a year to 1996, however, we would see what was essentially the Esprit swan song. After the initial plan to stick a V8 in the SX Turbo way back in 1980, Lotus decided they had waited long enough, and the Esprit V8 was launched, featuring twin turbochargers. Lotus could have very easily fitted the well-loved and well-proven Rover V8, however, they decided to design their very own 3.5 litre from the ground up. Sadly, due to the Renault gearbox having certain limitations, the potential 500 horsepower engine was detuned to just 350 horsepower. Still, the V8 had easily become the most powerful Esprit yet, with performance to match, a 0 to 60 time of just 4.1 seconds and a top speed of 175 miles per hour. Lotus would ultimately try to race the V8 in the GT1 class, featuring a completely revised powertrain putting out 550 horsepower, with a new gearbox to manage the bump in power. Despite previous success with the X180R in the early 90s, the Esprit GT1 could not match it, especially when put up against the likes of McLaren and Porsche with their massive budgets. With the FIA GT rules changing in mid-1996, the GT1 was pulled from competition, and only one chassis remains today. In 1998, the V8 was split into two distinct models, the SE, the more luxurious twin, and the GT, the more performance-orientated twin. Lotus took the GT idea to the extreme in 1999 with what would be the ultimate road-going Esprit, the Sport 350. Despite power remaining the same, a remap TCU, upgraded brakes, suspension, body and chassis, as well as a brand new carbon fibre rear wing, made this the meanest Esprit of them all. However, the Sport 350 was the last major push on the Esprit's behalf, and as the new millennium came in, the Esprit's days were numbered. With a final minor visual update in 2002 to bridge a few gaps, in February of 2004, the final Esprit rolled off the production line, and after 28 years, the Esprit name was put to the axe. Famously, as it lasted until 2004 with a design largely from the 1980s, the S4 Esprit will be one of the final road-going cars to feature traditional pop-up headlights, the other being the C5 Corvette, which ended production in the same year. However, the Esprit remained in the back of many fans' minds, including those at the company itself. In 2006, Richard Carr, who drew up the 2002 visual update, started work on a new Esprit, and it ended up going quite far. It was formally unveiled at the 2010 Paris Motor Show, with Lotus themselves planning to have it go into production in 2013. Power would come from a Lexus 5 litre V8, producing a supposed 612 horsepower, resulting in a 0 to 60 time of just 3.5 seconds and a top speed of 195 miles per hour. While the design was thoroughly modernised, personally, it was a little too generic to carry the Esprit name. However, in the end, it didn't matter, with Lotus cancelling the new Esprit project, instead, wanting to focus on lighter sports cars. It is unfortunate, as the past decade or two were notable for seeing many brands bring back classic sporty names, such as Ford with the GT, Honda revived the NSX, Toyota brought back the Supra, and Lamborghini even briefly revived the Countach. Lotus's new Esprit would have fit in with this crowd very comfortably, but I think that ship has sailed. 
and that really was the end of the Esprit. Lotus has since transitioned into making very different cars. Following their acquisition by Chinese automotive giant Geely, they have started producing electric models such as the 2000 horsepower Evaya and the ugh, ugh, crossover SUV, the Elytra. To be honest though, I think the Esprit is probably better off not being revived under this strange new creature that calls itself Lotus, because as we've all recently seen, wedges don't typically do well as electric vehicles. Instead, I'd call the Esprit very of its time, and I mean that in a good way. But while its contemporaries were fighting to be the best with big, heavy, thirsty, loud V8s and V12s, the Esprit was content with a simple four-cylinder and a propeller here and there, and I think that in many ways, that makes it the coolest supercar of them all. Thank you so much for watching, with a very special thanks to Brum Brum Brin, Jonas and Thomas Bradley, who are very generously donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. Just £1 a month is an amazing help, and I also have socials, links to them are in the description below. Again, thank you for watching, and take care.